So let's talk about the clock signal. Uh, the clock signal is really, really critical because it's a single signal that is supposed to reach a very large number of registers in a synchronous chip and it's supposed to reach all of them perfectly. It's supposed to be a perfect signal at each and every one of these registers. And that's not going to happen because there's no way we can distribute a single signal with such uh, an ideal behavior to such different areas of the chip. In fact, clock distribution faces many challenges uh, at every step in which we try to uh, deliver the, the, the clock to registers. Uh, the first step, clock generation, is in itself a very challenging step because when we generate the clock, it comes from a crystal oscillator normally. And this crystal oscillator is not ideal. There's going to be variations in the uh, period from one period to the next. This is going to introduce phase noise to the clock, which is something we have to deal with. But also, the clock is distributed or driven to different areas of the chip through large buffer chains. And there are buffer mismatches between these large buffer chains. So if you want to distribute it to one area and you use a buffer and another area and you use another buffer, even if you intended these buffers to be identical, there's going to be a mismatch between them. And so different areas of the chip are going to observe the clock at different times. And even if the buffers are perfect, the wires are not. So there's mismatch in the wires. Uh, even if you design them to be identical, they're not going to be identical. But how would you design wires delivering the clock to be identical if they are going to be of different length? And but even if all of that is perfect or ideal, there are differences in the load that the, that the clock observes. So the load that is offered by a, a one register could be different from another. There are also problems with temperature variations because different areas of the chip can heat up differently based on activity. And higher temperature leads to slower uh, moving signals. Uh, there's also noise or rather actually interference or coupling between wires, which will affect the, uh, the clock uh, either in a systematic way or in a random way. There are power supply variations, which could happen uh, in a spatial manner in the fact that certain areas of the chip observe a different supply from another due to resistive drops, or it could be something that varies with time um, depending on whether uh, we are observing ground and supply bounds, for example. So you'll find that all of these um, uh, non-idealities in the generation and delivery of the clock can be divided into two impacts on the clock itself. A uh, temporal impact that affects the clock from one cycle to another, basically by introducing phase noise. Because we don't really care about the amplitude of the clock as much as we care about its edges or phase. So there's a temporal effect which uh, manifests mainly in, in, in the form of phase noise. But there's also a spatial effect where the clock going to a certain area of the chip is going to be different from the clock observed at a different area of the chip because of differential delay. So the first is called clock jitter and the second is called clock skew. And they are both very significant issues that we have to understand very well. Uh, we have to understand how to mitigate them, but we first have to, have to understand what impact, if any, they have on the behavior of the circuit. Now, the first impact on clock that we see is Q, which is a, a spatial effect where the clock going to a certain register is going to be different from another register. And usually we draw it this way, which seems to suggest that Q comes mainly from a different wire length or wire mismatch. Whereas this is just one source of skew. Skew actually is uh, dominated by load mismatch and buffer mismatch rather than wire mismatch. But in any cases, the thing that really characterizes skew is that the uh, skew between the edges of different clocks is constant with time. It is not constant with space, meaning that different pairs of registers 
will observe different skews, but it is constant with time. It doesn't change from one cycle to the next. And so we are looking at a specific case here where we have two successive registers, R1 and R2, and these two successive registers uh, observe uh, two clocks, clock one and clock two. Now, um, the clock period that we would normally calculate for this very simple pipeline is t greater than or equal uh, t setup plus t cq plus tpd, which is the delay in the combinational logic. Now, we want to understand what happens to this clock period in the presence of skew. So we are going to assume that clock 2 is delayed relative to clock 1 by a value of ts, and ts is the value of skew. Now, the period available from the active edge of clock 1 to the active edge of clock 2 is now increased by the amount ts. And therefore, t plus ts has to be greater than or equal t setup plus tcq plus tpd. Because data has to be ready at the input of R1 at, t, at the time t setup, not before the edge of clock 1, but before the edge of clock 2, which is which gives us actually more time to finish. And so you observe that the clock period now is improved. We have to be greater than a smaller number than the number we had before, which means that we can operate at a higher frequency. Now, skew can actually be a, um, a negative number. If the clock was distributed in this direction instead of from left to right, then clock one would lag behind clock two in which case the value of ts would be a negative number because this edge would come earlier. In that case, the period is actually um, is devastated by subtracting the value of ts from t instead of adding it, which means we have a smaller period available. So depending on the direction in which you distribute the clock relative to data, skew can actually help or harm your clock period. But recall also that we had a condition on hold time where t-hold had to be less than or equal uh, tpd minimum, which is the best case delay through the combination logic, plus tcq. Following the same uh, reasoning we use for skew, uh, in the presence of skew, t-hold plus ts has to be less than tpd minimum plus tcq which says that t-hold is then going to have to be smaller than tpd plus tcq plus minus ts. So in the presence of positive skew, the condition on hold time becomes more strict. We have to have a smaller hold time. Recall that hold time comes from the, um, the, uh, from the clock. It comes from the uh, uh, skew between clock and clock bar. So we now cannot hold for as long as we used to before, and therefore the condition on hold time is now more strict and that's bad, which means that if skew is negative, that's good because it gives us more space for hold time and it reduces the amount of hold time violations. It allows more path in the circuit to have large positive skews without, po large positive slacks without causing a hold time violation. So actually negative skew is good for hold times, and it is bad for the clock period. In all cases, though, it's a small number relative to the period, but it might be a significant number relative to hold time. So if you are given the choice, you should choose negative skew because it helps you significantly with hold time while not really affecting uh, the clock period. Now, uh, because this requires an additional con constraint on the placement and routing tool, it's not usually a very practical thing to ask for. Now, jitter is a different phenomenon, but it's a related phenomenon. It's a phenomenon where if you look at this, a single clock, uh, the edges of the clock don't actually come at the time that you expect them to. Uh, there is a jitter or a uh, phase noise or uh, some sort of uh, hesitation around this average point at which you expect the edge to come. So you expect any two successive edges to come exactly T capital apart. They don't come exactly T capital apart. There's a range around this average value where uh, the edge could come. 
Now, this is a zero mean stochastic process, meaning on average, it should come at the expected um, time instant. But there is a finite variance around this average. And um, maybe a couple of standard deviations from that, we can take a value of Tj, which means that most values are within Tj plus or minus around the expected value. Now, what does jitter, how does it impact uh, our clock period? Uh, with jitter, we have to assume that the worst case is going to happen. So there was a best case and a worst case for skew. But that's because skew is a both a spa spatial effect, it's a, an effect that depends on space, but it is also a deterministic effect. Once you know how routing is done, you can determine a value for skew. For jitter, it's a, it's a stochastic process, it's a random process. Every single cycle, you don't know what the, where the uh, edge is going to come, you only know probabilities. So we have to assume the worst case, even though the best case is sometimes going to happen, but we don't really, we don't have the capacity to use that. So the worst case is that the first edge of the clock is going to come late, and the second edge of the clock is going to come early, because this reduces the available period from T capital to T capital minus 2TJ. The first register starts producing results here instead of the true edge, and the second register expects inputs T setup before this dotted line instead of the solid line, which means that the clock period now has to be calculated as 2 minus 2 Tj is greater than Tcq plus T setup plus Tpd, which then leads to T greater than 2 Tj plus Tcq plus T setup plus Tpd. So the clock period is worsened, it's in, it increased, and the operating frequency is decreased by virtue of jitter. Jitter actually doesn't have any effect on hold time, um, surprisingly. It doesn't really affect hold time in a positive or a negative way. And the reason for that is that jitter affects a clock edge for all the registers. It's a temporal effect. So if this edge comes late, it comes late for all registers. And so it, it doesn't really matter if uh, if the data starts to race out of the first register after this edge, because this is also the edge for the second register. And so the second register is going to start counting its hold time from this dotted line. So jitter doesn't have an effect on hold time.